today. Amen. So, Lord, we just pray for that greater revelation. All day, every day, Lord, you want to keep dropping greater revelation. Yes, we want, to, we want to memorize scripture, but we also want the oil of your spirit to massage the words that you've given us and to know how to apply it in every situation. And Jesus was a genius at doing this. And Lord, help us see how the way he lived will be able to give us more of those God moments, those moments in the middle of a day that we just see a door open that we weren't expecting and to seize the moment and walk through that open door for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so here we go. God's power is present to heal. Luke 5, healing the heart virus of the legalists. So that just needs a little bit of an explanation because he's going to talk a lot about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. If you read the Gospels, and especially Matthew, because Matthew had a very strong Hebrew background. It's an amazing book, but you look through that lens at, at the way Matthew wrote that and all the references back to the scriptures. Uh, Matthew was brilliant. But the legalists are, the, in this case, in the reference of the New Testament, were the people who knew the law, but they allowed their knowledge of the law to puff them up and to lose their first love. Aren't you glad that can't happen anymore? <laughs> Just seeing if you're awake. So, Lord, help me see if there's any legalist in me that needs to be put on the altar and sacrificed because... <sighs> That's a trouble. That's a problem. The word can kill without the spirit, right? So we have to be careful. Yes, of course, saturate yourself with the word, but also ask the Holy Spirit to oil it in us to know how it applies. And I think these men woke up, these legalists woke up every morning thinking that they were doing God's work, but they allowed their ego to get too puffed up. And we have to, you know, be reminded <laughs> who Jesus was. <laughs> The foot washer, right? You want to be great in my kingdom, then learn how to serve. Well, that's, that's a good reminder on a regular basis. Yeah, so Pastor just asked me to share a, a, of a God moment that we had this week, Sebastian and I. Uh, so so we, we got news that somebody needed food. And uh, so we said that we would drop off some food. And, and the guy lives five minutes from my house. So we were unexpecting. Sebastian and I knock on the guy's house and we, we thought we were just going to, you know, give him food. And, and he comes out and we didn't know, I didn't realize he was, he was blind and he, he had some other severe uh, issues that he's going through. He didn't go down the list, but he was, he was sick and he needed hope. And, and this encounter, he stepped out and he just, he's like, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And he was so grateful. And this is, this is the reason why we're sharing this because just look out for the God moments he'll make available the God moments and for his presence and glory to fall and for people that are hurting to encounter him so we blessed him and I asked him can I pray for you and I began to pray and this man just began to sob and it, it was just such a moving moment where the glory of God came and touched this man. I, I was praying. I, I forgot what I prayed for, but I prayed for healing. I prayed for an encounter. I prayed for a touch of God. And the Lord met him where he was. And he was filled with hope because Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, lives in us. And through us, people can encounter him. And so just be, be encouraged. He's opening these these little opportunities everywhere we go, church. And he's doing something. And he's doing something and he's using us. Amen? Amen. All we did was bring food to somebody, but I know the two people who delivered the food, David and Sebastian, will never forget it. Because when you're not expecting it and it hits you that hard, it just sticks with you. And it, and it marks you. In my, in my life, I, could, I can remember times when things marked me that I couldn't go back of not caring anymore. So, let's see, it says, great multitudes came together to hear Jesus, him, and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Okay, so clearly it's physical healing, no doubt. I'm praying we're going to hear testimonies of physical healings that were done today at the altar. And maybe they haven't happened yet, but will. Because he's not bound by time or place or distance. Lee's in Morristown Memorial Hospital. You think that matters to God? No. So they came together to hear him and to be healed of him of their infirmities. And as he was teaching, there were the legalists, the Pharisees, 
and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And they came out because they were so excited that this might be the Messiah. <laughs> I'm not a very good actor, but like clearly that was not why they came out. They came out because he was a heretic. And they were sitting there with their notebooks open waiting to catch him in a mistake. They were constantly doing this. That's part of the legalist argument is you think you know it all and nobody can change your mind about anything. There are certain things in the Bible that are not negotiable. No doubt about it. But if we're here as the change agent, if we're here to bring the kingdom into the world of hurting people like this poor man who did nothing to go blind and become disabled, how can we look down on someone like that? When it had nothing to do with he didn't make bad decisions. If we're to meet the world in their position of pain, we should always be having this filter open like, what's the best way for me to speak to this person right now in this situation? You will never go wrong, and you will always get a better answer from God than whatever you were going to do. <laughs> That's what I found out. Even if it's just a confirmation, he'll do it with you if you keep keep that open, right? And that's exactly what I think Jesus is doing here because that's what the, the word tells us, that he only did what he saw the Father doing and said what he heard the Father saying, right? How many would like that to be on your tombstone? <laughs> he never did anything unless the Father told him first. And then it says this amazing, wonderful statement, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Woo! That's always true. What could stop it is unbelief. And we don't think about that enough, but we should be careful because legalism, when you think you already know all the answers, you're not expecting to get another word from God. That's also unbelief, that you don't think there's any more revelation you can receive. And when you look at it through this lens, there's many places in the Bible where Jesus operates in this genius mode where he meets, let's say, the woman at the well who wasn't even expecting him to speak to her because she was a woman. And then she was a Samaritan, strike two. And she was a sinner, which she, she didn't think he knew, but he knew. Three strikes, you're out, not with Jesus. But did he start by saying, you know, it's a good thing you met me here today because I know you're a sinner. And if you got hit by a bus tonight, do you know what your eternal reward would be? I just came here to get water. No relationship. Let's be careful because even you can witness legalistically. Your motive could be great, but if you're not taking the time to honor relationship and build trust in somebody, not because you're trying to manipulate them, but because you really think Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> Thank you, Rosie. Yeah, he is. He's the best thing. But something can get lost in the translation if we're carrying that legalistic approach. I'm not saying it's ever happened to me. I'm sure it has. Didn't want it to. But look at the genius of Jesus. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And they could not find out how they might bring him in because of the crowd. So they went up on the rooftop, right? Like, how brilliant is this? They went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said to him, your faith has made you whole, you are healed. Right? Oh, we have a Bible scholar down here. He didn't say that. And that's, that's the thing I want to talk about today because I think this is part of the genius, but I hadn't seen it before, so maybe... Throw tomatoes at me if you think I'm wrong, but he says, your sins are forgiven you. Now, I, I didn't put that together until I spent a little time on it, and you'll, you'll find that, right, when you do that, and you study the word, and you ask him to show you. So it's like, what's the point of this? But, but if you think about the emphasis being that the legalists were there with their notebooks open, he knew, he knew the power of the Lord was present to heal this man, but he wanted to heal their heart of a virus of legalism too. He'll do both. He'll heal the man, but before that, he, he gives them one of those Jehovah sneaky moments, and he, gets, he gives them something to use against him because they take the bait, man. They just take that lure like a big, large-mouthed bass. <laughs> 
grabs that lure. The scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, we'll do what I call stealing, steel manning the argument. I don't know if you heard that term, but straw man argument is when you, when you rip down somebody's personality, and it happens in politics a lot. Steel man is, can we, can we look through the lens? They were following the law the way they were taught. So that's all they have. It's the only worldview they have because they think they know all the answers. But Paul got this great revelation. Who was one of the legalists, by the way? That it can't be about how well you follow the law because nobody can do it. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Doesn't mean you don't honor truth and you don't live for it, but that's not what gets you in. That's not what makes you in right standing with the Lord. Another day's topic, but he knows that they're thinking that way and he cares enough about his opponents to try to bring them onto his side. But he does it in a very subtle way. That's the genius of Jesus. You have his spirit in you. So he's making you a genius too. You know what? Say that to the person next to you. You are a Jesus genius. That is the nicest thing anybody said to you all day today. Aren't you glad you came to church? Yes. Now look what it says though. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, where are their thoughts? Point to the part of your body where you think the thoughts are. He answered and said, why are you reasoning in your hearts, not in your minds? Ha! This virus goes down into the heart. And once your heart gets hardened, you start writing decrees to divorce your wife. You know, this was what was going on in those days. Because of the hardening of your hearts, God said, fill in the blank, right? It's unbelief. It's thinking, I already know all the answers. Nobody knows all the answers. But when you're the pastor, they think you know all the answers. I'm not asking for pity. I'm not a victim. I love it. Then he says this. Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk? Huh. Right? So we don't see as many miracles we pray for people, and it doesn't always happen. I hope it does, but we have to live with the reality that it doesn't always happen, but that doesn't make us stop praying, and that doesn't add to our unbelief. So you would think, on a, on a surface level, it's harder to tell somebody to rise up and walk and see a physical miracle than it is just to say, forgive somebody. Right? But how hard is it to forgive people? Say la. I'm not rushing on this one. This is a supernatural gift. I never look at the people in the back. I love you too up there. <laughs> it's a supernatural gift that was not factory installed when you were born in the hospital. Forgiveness was not an easy gene for you to develop. God had to give you the grace to do it his way. Because he said, a new commandment I give you, I want you to love one another the way I have loved you. It's the love started by him forgiving you. Does it dismiss all the problems, right? Like if somebody goes to jail and they get saved, they still have to serve their sentence. So it's not this free pass. You still have to suffer the consequences of your mistakes, but you're now in prison, Paul was, not even for a mistake, but for persecution. And look at all the writing he did in prison, right? So wherever you are, God can use you. Joseph was used in prison. So many different examples. So I saw this him to say, you know what, maybe he's just going to the Pharisees and saying, which is easier? First of all, none of their people were healing anybody. And that's why he said, well, if I'm casting out demons by Beelzebub, who are your sons casting them out by? Because your sons aren't casting them out. And you're complaining I'm doing it on the wrong day. But at least the person got free. And maybe this was equivalent, you know, I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit in Scripture, but... That's, he was able to just keep taking out all the foundation of their arguments against him because he saw the law from the father's perspective. And they could only see it decade after century. It, they got into this legalistic position where they were like kiss the ring kind of people. 
most of the people in the culture didn't read and write. They didn't have school systems and all that. So the ones who knew how to read and write had a position of authority. And they could always pull rank on people and make, make you feel inferior because they were smarter than you. Jesus is like, no, no, you don't have to qualify to get into the kingdom. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your home. See, an evil and adulterous generation wants to see a sign. Forgiveness is not obvious the way getting healed from paralysis would be. I personally, again, I'm just telling you what, what's going on in my brain, is that I think this was a sign to the Pharisees, the legalists who had this heart virus, who we still have to be aware of, whatever that virus is called, that that can creep in and we can stop being hungry to want to learn more of revelation from God, right? It's the application part that's the hardest because it's really easy to judge people. And, and these Pharisees kept doing that. They kept elevating more and more with their power, quote, unquote. And Jesus is thinking, you know, you guys are supposed to be running my father's family business. And you're misrepresenting him. And the man did get up and walk. So I'm sure some of those legalists were scratching their head like, wow, he's trying to tie physical healing into forgiving people. And he's saying it's easier to forgive somebody than it is to heal them. But we don't forgive anybody. We just hold, we hold a long record of their charges against them. Huh. I kind of answered this. Why forgiveness of sins before bodily healing? Did he need his sins to be forgiven before he got healed? No. Jesus knew the legalists were there to oppose him. And by forgiving the man's sins first, Jesus addressed the aspect of God's nature that the legalists often overlooked. His mercy and desire to forgive. Can you lift your hand and say, Lord, give me some of that. <laughs> give me some of that mercy and desire to forgive. I know we have to hold people accountable for what they do, but we want your heart. We want to balance all of this out in a way that your word comes through us and people's lives are shifted by your love. Man, that's a complicated topic, isn't it? What's love? But we must guard against the heart virus, I'll say it, of legalism. Scripture in, in 2 Timothy 3, 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. And let me tell you, there's a whole long list of a bunch of other things. But I'm just making that point to you, because what's the greatest commandment? You all know it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor. Wow. Tough one, right? That's what the Jews were saying. That's what the people before Jesus were there would, would have told you is the greatest commandment. The love your neighbor as yourself part's not so easy, is it? But look at what happens. Here's these leaders. Jesus got done in Luke 16 saying, you cannot serve God and mammon. And I would say the God of mammon, having worked on Wall Street all these years, it's an idol. It's a spirit. It's not just money because God can use money mightily. We needed to pay for those speakers that you're going to see next week. God can use money. He wants to use it. He wants us to be able to be generous people. So it's not the money that's evil. It's, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And that spirit is mammon. That's my opinion. 14 says, now the Pharisees who were... You see what I'm saying? Like, they're supposed to be the ones, most of all, saying, I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. And this is just obvious enough to Luke that he's saying, now the Pharisees, who everybody knows were lovers of money, also heard these things, and they derided him. So you could see the disconnect in, in the heart of Jesus. And it, look, it doesn't take long. Just go to Matthew 21, and you'll see that he goes in. And I'm only giving you a little quick summary here, right? But in Matthew 21 is when he went to the temple and he turns the tables over of the money changers. And he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, not a den of thieves. He's speaking to the Pharisees. They had a deal going. The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to people who will bear fruit of the kingdom. He says that in 2143. And then if you go to chapter 23, it's there's a whole bunch of them. I'm just giving you some low lights, <laughs> not highlights. Listen to the words that they tell you, people, but don't do what they do. 
He says, you shut off the kingdom of heaven and you prevent people. You're the very ones. You're the leaders who are supposed to be bringing them in, not you all. You get what I'm saying? I'm not accusing anybody here of being legalistic. I'm just saying let's guard against it because there's this oil of the Holy Spirit that can keep us on that narrow road that leads to life. You shut off the kingdom of heaven. You devour widows' houses. You make converts who become twice the sons of hell that you are. I thought Jesus was a nice guy. What happened? Well, he has a reason because they're misrepresenting his father. They're the people that the, that the population is looking up to, and they're misrepresenting his father. You desecrate the temple with, with money. So it's going to get better, I promise. You'll be smiling soon. <laughs> you tithe from your luxuries and your spices. That's because they had the money to have luxuries and spices. The, the common people didn't. So you're thinking it's a big deal because you give a tenth of your mint and your dill and your cumin, if I'm saying that right. But you've ignored the essentials of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These should have been done without neglecting the others, right? You see, the priority should be the justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You hypocritical blind leaders, you spoon out the fly from your soup. <laughs> and you swallow a camel. This is the voice version. You'll get a bunch of wows in the voice version. So how does this apply today? It's always good to bring that topic up, right? So I'm going to give you a trigger warning. Ready? Look at the person next to you. Say, are you ready? Okay. Did they say yes? I warned you. Trigger warning. We have off-year elections this year. No! Think about it, right? You hear elections, you automatically remember all the people that disagreed with you about something and, like, don't want to talk to you anymore. You've been labeled a heretic because you didn't want to do this or you didn't want to do that or you voted for the wrong person and Thanksgiving dinner turns into this big ruckus, like, argument thing about who you voted for and all these things. That is a plan of the devil. A plan of the devil. We should be able to talk to each other and respect each other enough. That's what that steel man idea is to say, I respect you. I just disagree with your opinion about this. Can we talk about it? That's forever been the case in America that we could do that. And the universities were the place where you could do it the most. It wasn't meant to be a safe place when it came to not disagreeing about, about the right answer. There's unity in diversity. That's university. Go there and see, see what you learn. Now, we sent our kids there like lambs being fed to the slaughter half the time, not knowing what they were being taught. And one of the good things, at least from COVID, is that the mothers of the, of the kids in school, in grammar school, got to look over the kid's shoulder and listen to the teacher and say, they're saying, what? So what the devil meant for evil, even that, and it was evil. Wow, God turned it around for good. If we do something about it, huh. yeah, if we do something about it, but not if we just say, well, it doesn't matter. It's all going to burn anyway. It's like, why vote? It's like you're just moving around the, the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's all sinking anyway, so why bother? Hmm. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violence hide in the closet. <laughs> Wrong translation. Sorry. <laughs> For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifest that he might play patty cakes with the devil. No, destroy the works of the devil. As the Father has sent me, Trisha, I'm sending you to go destroy the works of the devil. Boy, she's good at that. So, maybe we can look through the lens that God's power is present to heal everything, even heart virus of legalism, which might be one of the main things stopping the church from being more effective in America today. The physical healing happened when the man was paralyzed, but Jesus is looking to shift the whole culture. Jesus was dealing with four converging worldviews. I'll go quickly through this, but we should think about this because there's a spiritual worldview in a culture, which could be paganism, 
right? I mean, thankfully in America, there's so much scripture in all the founding documents that it's obvious to anybody who's willing to look or listen to a guy like David Barton, who's a historian about the, the spiritual roots of America. It's undeniable that scripture had so much to do with the way we started and why we're a free nation, why there was enough confidence to think that people could govern themselves. But that's be trying to be taken away from us. We're not smart enough to know whether we should take a vaccine or not. They have to make that decision for us. Sorry, you're not putting anything in my body that I don't want put in my body unless I'm on death row. I'm not on death row. But there's a fourth one. It's not just spiritual, cultural, and political, as important as those are. Jesus' point, and our point should be today, the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's what I'm going to go to my grave talking about because it's just been hidden, it seems to me, from a lot of people in the church that we're here to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. It's not just when we die and go to heaven. It's available to us now if we will tap into it and if we have the eyes to see the way he wants us to, to operate and walk. And if you don't pray, you're not going to know what he's telling you because he doesn't force himself in on you to do anything. But when you yield yourself to him and say, I'm, I'm seeking you, Lord, I'm seeking you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be well fed. The rewarder of the diligent seeker is God. So the Jewish religion, we know that, that, that they had lost their way. These people were all cut up, caught up in their own importance. Culturally, in his day, the Greek culture was dominant. All the philosophers, you can remember from when Paul is on Mars Hill in the book of Acts, they're trying to say, what is this babbler trying to say? And then politically, the Roman government, my, my relatives, that's a mean group of people right there. Let's talk about needing the Holy Ghost. But they did have something called citizenship. And when Paul got wrongly locked up, he said, you know, is this the way you're going to treat a, a Roman citizen? And they said, you're a Roman citizen? We're in trouble. So they tried coming at night. Oh, you can go now. No? No, you locked me up in broad daylight. You're going to come back and give me a public apology. I thought you're supposed to be nice if you're a Christian. You're supposed to tell the truth. Speak the truth in love. So this really is a great summary. Therefore, don't worry. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? After all these things the Gentiles seek, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but come on, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things. Thank you, Lord. I believe it. You said it, I believe it. If I seek your kingdom first, let the chips fall where they may. I'm not taking a shot. Psalm 85. <laughs> Just throwing that in there. <laughs> Verse 10 of Psalm 85. Oh, love this. It says, mercy and truth have met together. Think about why they would be hard to meet together. Because truth was the Pharisees. And that's that hard edge. We caught her in adultery, and the, word, the law says to stone her to death. What do you say? I don't know. I'm going to write down and see what my father's going to tell me first. Oh, okay. Whoever has no sin, you can throw the first stone. Drop, 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 and they all walk away. That was genius. Did he know at breakfast that was going to happen? No. He just lived in this open relationship with the Father, and if he didn't know, he didn't say anything. He waited. He wasn't pressured into doing something. Take notes on that, right? Mercy, the love of God, meets with the truth of God, They've met together, and then righteousness, which would be like the truth, and peace have kissed together in Jesus. That's where it happened. Psalm 85.10. This perfect balance, who we're supposed to be representing, just saying, we're Christians, we carry his name, we have his spirit, he gave us his word, like, this should be happening in us too, right? Not putting anybody down. It's not easy. Because we live in a world. We live in a really difficult, sinful world. But we can be determined to have a goal to be more like him, to be transformed into his image. And then Mark 1, 4 says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching the baptism of repentance. There's forgiveness, right? There's forgiveness. 
that we've been talking about. And Jesus, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Forgiveness. Receive the forgiveness that you need. How does this apply to politics and the Thanksgiving dinner? All I'm asking all of us to do is look at your family members who don't understand your decision-making process and have a little mercy. That's all. Instead of knowing all the answers, try to learn what they're talking about so you can talk to them with respect. This shouldn't be very difficult to do, but we have that Italian in us, that gorilla who's shaking the cage, let me out. That's the anger that rises up when somebody offends you with something, but, but the Holy Spirit will give you self-control that you don't have to do that. You could just say, you know what, I just got to use the men's room for a minute. I'll be right back for the turkey and the, you know, pass the cranberry sauce. And you go in the bathroom, you're like, what do I say? But because you asked, he'll tell you. Isn't he faithful? He'll tell you. He'll tell you what to do. And Paul sees this coming. I know it's 1209, but he sees this coming, boldly proclaims, crazy preposterous that Jesus, the crucified Jesus, is now the Lord of the world. Who's going to believe that? Here we are all these years later. They believe it. I believe it. But it made no sense to them in the natural. But it also meant that Caesar wasn't the Lord of the world. <laughs> Big difference. Moving from place to place, he demonstrates the dynamics of God's kingdom with signs and wonders. Birthing kingdom communities. That's us. That's the ecclesia. We're kingdom communities that are all trying to help each other move forward in serving God in a way that's going to bring him all the glory. Not unto us, unto your name, Lord, be all the glory. Help us to make you famous in this whole region. And let people that don't know you realize that you are the best option of all the choices they have. Your way is the best way. Anybody else believe that? I mean, you are in church. <laughs> Powerful living examples of the Jesus worldview not political, but the gospel of the kingdom, growing disciples into a body of Christ in the earth. And when they brought that food to that guy, that was just the arm of God extending and saying, here's some food, but here's the gospel. We're not just dropping the food off. We want to pray for you. I pray he gets healed of blindness. You know he's praying he gets healed of blindness. But the thing is, it was the county that called. See, the county knew that that the church, that the faith-based community has a heart to help people. They were the ones that said, "Do you can you bring the food to the guy? Because we don't have anybody here right now that can bring the food. I'm like, oh, I don't know. No, come on, of course. Of course we're going to bring the food. That's why we're doing this. Okay, so some of the Pharisees got saved. I'm going to cut to the chase now, okay? This is amazing that the people that were Sadducees and Pharisees that were so locked into that legalistic thinking, Holy Spirit got in there, softened them up, and they came out and became strong disciples of Jesus, including Paul, by the way. Right? So Romans 2, God's kindness leads us to repentance. Think of that verse at the Thanksgiving table. Or the lunch table in your office where everybody's coming against you because you're a Christian. That happened to anybody besides me? Yeah. So, it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Hmm. Romans 2, 4. Do you take the kindness of God for granted? Do you see his patience and tolerance as a sign that he's a pushover when it comes to sin? How could you not know that his kindness is guiding our hearts to turn away from distractions and habitual sin to walk a new path? Personally, I think Paul purposely stayed making tents so that he could remember what it's like to be lost. Because he had a heart for the lost. So yes, it's great that we gather together, but let's not be afraid to be with unbelievers. This is what we're here for. Light belongs in the darkness, right? So let's just go out ready, not fully knowing exactly what's going to happen, but knowing that we serve a God who will give us everything we need. Load up your bank account with the Word and Holy Spirit and prayer and worship and praise, and then go out and watch how he uses you when you least expect it. I thank God. I'm just going to go a little faster now. I thank God who has given me strength. This is Paul talking now. The, the Pharisee whose heart was healed of that legalistic virus. Man, was he shifted. 
This is how he says it. I thank him who's given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer and a persecutor, an insolent opponent. Anybody else have that testimony? Before you became saved, you were an opponent of Jesus. I'm just going to wait a little longer, okay? So we don't forget where we came from. <laughs> Why does he have to talk about that? But I received mercy. Say it. I received mercy. If I expect to receive mercy, I should be willing to show mercy. I think that's in the Bible. I've acted, I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, like the people arguing with you most of the time, just never heard a valid version of the gospel. And the grace of our Lord Jesus overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Then in Galatians, he says, when I was still in my mother's womb, he chose and called me out of sheer generosity. He caught this revelation. No matter how many Stephens that he killed, no matter how many people that he killed for the sake of the gospel, he still knew that in spite of those past mistakes, now God had him where he was supposed to be. Now he has intervened and revealed his son to me so that I might joyfully tell everyone about him. What things were gained to me, that's Philippians 3, I'm guessing a lot of you know that. The things that I believe were the most important as a legalist were having to follow the law perfectly in order to please God. And I was really good at condemning other people when they didn't do it the way I like to do it. Could that happen today? I'm getting a couple of those kind of looks. Yeah, sure could. But all of that stuff that used to drive my worldview, thinking that righteousness with God comes from following the law, I realized that was a mistake. And I have been willing, he would have said, to suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ, be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. Tracking? Light bulb went off. It's not about following the rules but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Can we stand? Because this is really key, right? That, uh, that we would not be know-it-alls, that we not be people that, that think there's nothing left to learn, how we would be shortchanging the Holy Spirit and his ability to give us fresh revelation. Give us today the daily bread that we need, Lord. The bread that doesn't go stale. What you have for me today, every day. It's not like you stop being a Christian because it's not Sunday. It's, it's meant Monday 24-7. Even when you're sleeping, God can speak to you. Isn't that awesome? He never slumbers or sleeps. He doesn't take a vacation. Huh? He has a great work-life balance. He's always available. Because it's not work for him. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Increase mercy and truth have kissed together. Righteousness and peace have met each other in Jesus. Let that be our heart, Lord. Let that be our desire, our aspiration. To walk, yes, of course, to walk in the truth of your word. But to walk in the humility that you want to show us along the way. The genius, Jesus version of living life in this very, very secular world. Give us compassion instead of judgment. Speak through us as we talk. I'm going to end here. It's Romans 12. It says... Love others well and don't hide behind a mask. Could that happen in church? I won't look at anybody. Sure, you know, sure it could happen. But we sure are trying to take the masks off and just let you know it's okay to be who you are because whoever you are, God loves you. But he loves you so much he doesn't want you to stay here, wherever here is. He wants you to grow. That's what a good father does, right? And he's a good father. So love others well. For me, at least, that means don't judge them. Don't behind, hide behind a mask. Pursue what is good as if your life depends on it. 
Pretty good, right? For the voice version again. Pursue what is good as if your life depends on it. Man, that's a deep truth. In the regular everyday thing that I think is just normal and boring routine. No. The kingdom of God's available to you in every single situation. Let your spirit be on fire, bubbling up and boiling over as you serve the Lord. If it's within your power, make peace with all people. Doesn't mean you're forgiven their, their, their transgressions, but you forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Right, that's how this has to work. I've received this amazing mercy. Give me the chance, Lord, speak the truth in love, but also realize that, but for the grace of God, that could have been me, whoever it is that I'm talking to. And he has this amazing scripture that says, in our weakness, his strength is perfected. So just at the very time that you feel the most vulnerable, if you all ask for help, he'll show you what to do. Believe that? And uh, never let evil get the best of you. Instead, overpower evil with good. Lord, I just speak that over your people today, over the people that are watching online. I thank you that there's a higher way to live than a religious, legalistic spirit. I love that you would physically heal, heal people, but you also emotionally heal people, that that virus of legalism, Lord, can be purged from our lives, that you have given us everything that we need to live a life that is pleasing to you, that we might hear you say, well done, now good and faithful servant. I, I wasn't necessarily very good at it, but I believed you, so I tried the best I could. That's what he asked us to do, to just give it the best effort that we can because his power is always present to heal people. And I deputize every one of you to be ambassadors for the kingdom as you go out from here today, that you would be hungry for God, that you would serve him like it says here, let your spirit be on fire, bubbling up and boiling over as you serve the Lord. If it's within your power, pursue peace, it says in another scripture, pursue peace with all people. You're half of the equation. You can't control what they do to you, but you can control what comes out of your mouth and the way you handle it. And I bless your people, Lord, to live this out in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you very much. I hope you know that. It's a big family. So if the Lord stirred anything in you today and you would like prayer, we've got an aisle right over here where people come to pray. And then there's people in the front row that'll be here to pray for you for whatever that need is. And if this is new to you and you'd like to learn more, if you think there's some things that he said today that really struck me, please come up for prayer. We're not running out. Please come up for prayer. Love you.